Hi, my name is Carmen Bowman. I have fun calling myself a regulator turned educator. After a career in activities, I became a state surveyor in Colorado and also moved to Baltimore and worked at the Central Office of Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, Division of Nursing Homes, loved it. Got to train surveyors nationally. I've been very fortunate to be a part of many uh, culture change projects uh, over three decades and nationally with CMS, with every partner in the culture change movement. Um, I call my business Educatering, Catering Education for Compliance and Culture Change. And the reason for that is you can't have one without the other. I've just seen in my career that if you're talking about regulations, guess what? The best way to meet them is through our culture change practices. And if you're talking about culture change, guess what everybody wonders about? The regulations. And it's my joy to show people that you can have them both. And culture change, changing institutional culture is the way to go. And it's the way to be compliant and it's the way to create home and life and living for those who actually live there. In fact, that's what culture change means. We're talking about just only when we think of change or transformation, we're talking about the institutional culture. And it really calls for a shift in how we all look at this building, uh, rather than looking at it as only a medical, clinical, skilled nursing facility, <laughs> that it's actually home to the people who live there. In fact, I've been wondering lately about maybe we should think of ourselves as home health care professionals because we are actually walking in and out of people's home. And the, the teams that recognize that and start to talk about that, they start to unravel the institutional trappings and instead really protect the fact that this is the people's home who lives here. In fact, Dr. Bill Thomas, uh, the founder of the Eden Alternative and the Greenhouse Project and many other things, he encourages us to be aware of what he calls the institutional dragon. And he's right. He, he, he loves to put things in analogies that we need to slay this dragon and it's very hard, but it can be done. You are going to see in this video how it's been done and we invite all of you to consider also doing it. My own culture change journey started with Dr. Bill Thomas's first book, uh, Life Worth Living. That's how I fell in love with the culture change movement, the Eden Alternative, quality of life. I'm proud to be an Eden Alternative associate and Eden Alternative mentor for many years. And look at what his book is called, Life Worth Living. In fact, it's leaders like Dr. Thomas that have shown us that we need to talk more about life and living that people are doing instead of the care that we are providing and that they are receiving. In fact, uh, Dr. Bill Thomas, who is a physician, uh, teaches that if you think of your and my life, if you think of your life, here's your big, beautiful life. How much medical care do you have? Usually it's just a little bit on the side. And now you live in a nursing home and the big part is actually the medical care part, medical care, clinical care, treatment, therapy, medications, right? And the real life part is a little on the side. And we would like to switch that and create, give people, of course, back their big, beautiful life. Uh, medical care should just be on the side. Let's look at the language. I'd love to show you something here. So if someone older has to move out of their home, the time has come to leave this dear home of 40 years that's so hard, where do most people tend to move to first? Independent, what's it called? Independent living. And then they need more assistance. And where do they move to? Assisted, what's it called? Assisted living. And then they need more care. And what do we call it? Long-term care. I want you to watch this. Where did the living go? Even in our language, even in our titles, the living disappeared, but it doesn't have to. Something else I want to show you, and I'll bring it together here. Uh, CMS in the State Operations Manual, first section, definitions. Back in 2016, 
defined for the first time person-centered care. It means to focus on the resident as the locus of control and support the resident, the person, in making their own choices and having control over their daily lives. Sadly, most nursing homes aren't known for that, but it's right in the regs. And something I wanna point out is, to be honest, I don't know that that really defines care. I think it defines living. It's more than care. In fact, beware, person-centered care is not the same as culture change. Somewhere along the way, start people started to intertwine, interchange the terms. Culture includes care, but it's a lot more than care. So person-centered care does not equal culture change. And to be honest, the idea, the language of person-centered was already outdated when CMS did publish this in 2016. So think about person-centered, wow, that's good, right? But in the movement, we had already moved on to calling it person-directed. Uh, one of the leaders in our movement, Maggie, Dr. Maggie Calkins, pointed out um, at a big national event, the Creating Home Symposium in 2018, that self-directed is what we mean. Because you and I want to self-direct our life as long as we live, no matter where we live. And so we had moved on to person-directed, self-directed, resident-directed, and we had moved on from care. Think about this. Care gets talked about a lot. Medical care, clinical care, 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 long-term care, person-centered care. And what's missing, like I pointed out, even in the definition, <laughs> I think it represents life personally. And so m learning from others in this movement, we need to focus more on the life that people are living and not just the care that they are receiving. And we'd love to invite you to join us. In fact, that's a premise of this culture change grant project that's been taking place in Wyoming for three years. We call it implementing culture change throughout Wyoming, affecting resident directed living and get this, team member retention. Why? Because 30 years of our culture change movement have shown you will ret ret retain <laughs> and recruit team members to want to work there when it's a change culture. So with that focus on life and living, um, I, I got a grant uh, to work in the state of Wyoming and the grant itself is called Implementing Culture Change Throughout Wyoming, Affecting Resident Directed Living and Team Member Retention. Changing institutional culture tends to have all the outcomes we want. Uh, people want to work there, so you have less turnover, you have higher retention. We see it over and over. People want to live there, so your nursing home is full, which is what the business side wants. And when you give very individualized, uh, preference-based, um, I don't even want to say care, when you honor someone's life and how they want to live, uh, it's more efficient. You're going to hear that. And so part of this grant um, was to have an annual conference. And one year, it was the annual conference was supposed to be five workshops throughout Wyoming, and we were going to go to five homes that are changing institutional culture. Well, that didn't happen, and it got changed into five videos. This is one of them. And so we are going to show you uh, what a home has done that has adhered to the Eden Alternative. This is simply a pathway to change institutional culture, actually started by Dr. Bill Thomas and his wife Jude. We're grateful to them. And we're gonna see how it really impacted uh, this particular community. And we now go to the great state of Wyoming and we zoom into the town of Green River and we learn from Mission at Castle Rock. Hi, my name is Bobby Jo Drozd and I'm the Executive Director of Mission at Castle Rock Rehabilitation Center. We began our Eden or Resident Centered Care journey back in 2014 and I'm just going to share with you um, some of the things that we've incorporated in our community that has made us better at um, serving our elders in resident-centered care. Um, 
I think the biggest transition for us was changing an institutional approach to care um, to from the get-go involving our residents in developing their care plans and letting us know what they expected and wanted from us. Um, that starts with Simply Me surveys that we do with the residents when they're admitted and it gives us an idea of what the residents history is, um, what their simple pleasures are, what their likes and their dislikes are, um, whether they prefer a bath or a shower, whether um, they're a night owl or they want to sleep in. And we worked hard to get out of the institutional way of passing meds at a certain time and um, serving meals at a certain time and being regimented to, to giving that choice to our elders. Um, we participate in open dining. We have a five meal a day program to be able to meet all the needs um, of the different residents coming in and what their likes and dislikes are, their wants. We um, also, in orientation, start the education of culture change with our new care partners. We've changed our language. We don't refer to our staff as staff, but their care partners and our residents are care partners as well. And we partner together to make this a home-like environment with the residents in control. Um, we focus on living here in our community. In fact, we had our residents as part of a committee that changed our mission statement and our mission statement is we care, we love, and we live. And we really try and uphold that mission statement here in our home and um, do our best to make our residents feel that this is um, their home and that it's sacred work that we do in their home and that we're honored to participate in that with them. Um, some of the things that we have done is um, just thinking outside the box and bringing spontaneity to the care that we deliver as part of our Eden journey and focusing on addressing the plagues of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. Our goal is for our residents to feel loved, to live, and to experience life in our home. Hi, I'm Angie and I have been honored to be a nurse in skilled nursing homes and long-term care for over 20 years. Um, I've worked in um, a couple different places doing things different ways and as times have changed, I've got to um, be instrumental in those changes and how um, processes change and how um, culture changes developed over time. And so, um, you, when I first started nursing, um, Mill Med Pass was very, very um, strict in certain times, and you only had an hour before and an hour after to make sure that people got their medications at certain times of the day. Um, and that became really hard because people have different lifestyles before they come to us. Some people have worked night shifts their whole life. Some people like to sleep in and and maybe they worked evening shift or maybe they were the homemaker and they were up early in the morning and getting everything ready for the day. Um, and so it was really hard and we, we saw a lot of behaviors and different things with the residents as we forced our schedule on them. Um, and so, you know, what we've done here and how we've changed it is we look at medication like you you would at home. If somebody takes a medication three times a day, you know, they don't wake up at four in the morning to take that medication. They take it when they wake up. They take it halfway through their day, and then they take it again before they go to bed. So um, our med pass times are, they're very open. Um, something that's given once a day might just be scheduled throughout a whole, 12 hour day shift that you can give it any time during that day shift, what works with that resident. Things that are three times a day, they will have a range time. So maybe it's six to 10 and um, in the morning and then um, 10 to two in the afternoon. And, you know, as the nurse, you, you make that judgment. If you gave it at six, then naturally you're gonna give it at the earlier part of the next range time. 
um, but working with that resident and their day and their schedule, um, giving pain medication around um, therapy, um, different things that they do, giving their sleeping medication at the time that they're going to go to sleep at night and not, you know, right at 6 p.m. because that's when we want them to go to sleep. So um, we've spent a lot of time and it, and it took some getting used to, but really we look at the individual resident, what their needs are, what their preferences are, um, and um, how they like to take their medication, you know, so they, they get a little bit more more choice in, in all of those things. So a good example of um, giving medications in time ranges. So an example of a medication for that would be um, if somebody gets a blood pressure med um, twice a day and maybe they don't wake up till 10 o'clock in the morning, then we, if we have a time range of 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. to give it, it's okay for us to give it at 10 a.m. And then when the nine o'clock dose comes, um, and say that's from you know 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. It's okay to give it closer to that 10 p.m. mark. So we have have a little bit more leniency and room with that. Um, the only thing that we really don't like to try to um, flex times very much on are antibiotics and things that need to be very specifically 12 hours apart or eight hours apart. At that point. Um, we, we definitely stick to um, the times there for, you know, the infection purposes. So sometimes people question, how do you keep track of the time that medications are given, even if it's from a day shift to a night shift? And really for that, um, our electronic medical records system shows us the time that, that, it, that it was administered. Um, so we can always look back at that. And then also, you know, those are important things that we add to our reports each day, um, nurse to nurse. We know that we're trying to provide personalized care for our resident. So um, those are important things for our report shift to shift. Um, if we have medications that are due say in the morning um, that might have a 6 a.m to 10 a.m time range again um, with that we don't really use that hour before an hour after because we're already using a time frame to be able to give that medication so um, really with the exact medication times when we're working on antibiotics things like that we kind of follow that hour before hour after but those time ranges give us the, the time before and after and, and just make it more feasible for us to do that. So we don't really utilize the hour before, hour after. So um, just as we made changes to our medication pass, we also you know noticed that just the same, people are morning people, people are night people. Some people worked the night shift um, for their entire career, and so they prefer to be up more at night, and they're not going to eat breakfast. And honestly, what we've seen along um, along the lines is that sometimes people have a weight loss because they don't eat breakfast at all because we're waking them up, they're sleeping at the dining room table, and um, really we're hurting their sleep and um, their recovery time to try to force them to eat something that they don't want at a time they don't want. So um, we implemented what we call five meals a day. And what that consists of is we have um, basically breakfast, lunch, then we have, um, we call fiesta snack and that's between lunch and dinner. And then we have um, a bedtime snack. So we are offering substantial items um, five times a day. Um, they don't all necessarily eat all of those meals. They get to pick and choose. You know, some people might not, like I was saying, they might not like breakfast. They might not do well getting up at seven in the morning and getting ready for breakfast. I know I, I don't. Um, so 
they might have the fiesta snack instead. Um, and that's just allowing them times um, to eat when it's more convenient for them. Um, not always is fiesta snack or um, bedtime snack something um, large and huge and you know a four course meal, but it's always something substantial and they can always order things from the dining room. We have kind of just a set um, menu that has, you know, grilled cheese, for instance, or certain soups and different different things that they can choose to eat throughout the day whenever they like. Um, so that's the five meal a day, which leads me right into our open dining. Um, in open dining, we, we don't just serve breakfast at 7 a.m. and that's it. We um, have open time, so breakfast the main meal is served from 7 to 9.30 a.m. And then after that, again, there are things that are available that can be made to order. Um, and um, we do that same thing for lunch and dinner. So everybody doesn't have to be in the dining room at 7 a.m. and 11 and 5 p.m. Um, it's pretty, pretty open as to when they can come in and eat that main meal that's being served. And then again, like I said, they can order things individually from there. We always have um, stuff available at the nurse's station. There's a whole kitchen area there as well where we can um, heat and make things up, um, a full refrigerator of different items um, as well. So they don't even necessarily have to go to the dining room. And um, you know, a couple of years ago, we did some um, restructuring of the dining room and, and we took a wall out, which kind of opened up our dining area to our foyer area as well. And we've made um, different areas for private seating too. So that are more home-like for, for residents who maybe are more alert and oriented and wanna sit and have conversations with one another or even between meals having coffee at these kind of nice little sitting areas so um, we've just tried to enhance dining overall to meet their routines and schedules but also to just feel more home-like overall So um, a prime example um, that I can give you that elaborates a little bit on um, people getting the sleep and the rest that they need. Um, we had a, a little lady that um, for years, you know, we would, we would get her up, um, we would put her at the dining room table and we would expect her to eat. Um, she was diabetic. She had um, other comorbidities and health issues, but Ultimately, we kept seeing a weight loss on her and, and it didn't matter what we changed in her diet, um, the supplements we added, um, even looking at kind of likes and dislikes of meals, those things didn't really change much. When we saw the biggest change with her was when we found out and realized and started looking more into her past and her history that she was in fact a night shift worker her whole life. So we had entirely flipped her routine backwards. And with that, we had a lot of behaviors. She had dementia. So um, we had a lot of behaviors with her yelling out or she was just sleeping through everything. And um, once we kind of started looking at what maybe her life looked like before coming um, to um, a skilled nursing facility, we were able to change that up a little bit, you know, and um, allow more food available for the nurses at night to offer her meals during the night, switch up a little bit what time we were doing blood sugars. You know, everybody um, has their fasting period. Hers was a little bit different. So her blood sugars actually came down a little bit because we were checking her sugar later in the day after she had, you know, eaten a later snack at night because she was up all, all night. Um, getting that sleep made her behaviors um, diminish almost to obsolete. 
um, her, like I said, her sugar stabilized, her intake stabilized, her, her weight stabilized. Um, she actually became um, a different person than, than what we knew just because she was able to live in her own routine and what was comfortable for her in her life before we implemented that here. You know, not everybody has to sleep all night long, but if they're gonna, you know, if they're gonna be awake all night, we also have to look at their daytime routine and how we can do things differently and, and getting, um, you know, all the departments involved in that. You know, that includes activities, dietary, nursing. Everybody plays a role in making sure that we're meeting those people's individual needs to support a healthier lifestyle overall. One of the things that really spoke to a few of us here at Mission was intergenerational programming um, and ageism. And what does that mean? Um, and so myself, along with the activities director and our corporate resource team, we developed a curriculum and we kind of went out on a limb and I approached our local school board and we talked to them about first just doing some education on ageism with the school system. So the first, um, the first breakthrough we had was just getting permission to go into um, the school and do some education about ageism with the fifth grade class. From that, um, one of the teachers actually approached me and said, hey, I have an idea. Maybe we can work together and bring the kids into your home and mind you they'd come every once in a while maybe make valentine cards and drop them by or maybe come and sing every once in a while but it was nothing that was scheduled and planned and it wasn't part of our our home part of our lifestyle and so i took that back to corporate and um we actually went to a class out in i think it was little rock arkansas um and learned more about intergenerational programming and i took what i learned there and brought it back and we wrote a curriculum along with this school teacher and we proposed it to the school board and they actually wrote into the fifth grade core curriculum part of their social sociology work um, was to come up here once every other week for an hour and integrate with our elders and it was actually planned. Um, and so sometimes um, we would even bring like a science, um, a science lesson into that integration and they would do science experiments with our residents here in the nursing home. Um, they, the students participated in the Simply Me interviews and um, becoming well known with our residents and establishing relationship and so it proved to just be a very effective um, program for us because the elders love having the kids here. The spontaneity of the kids and integrating them into our programs was amazing. Um, and the kids became well known to our elders and they enjoyed that time. And what that did for us over time was it exposed our fifth graders who later become freshmen in high school, who later become juniors in high school. And because they had developed that relationship um, through that program and were no longer afraid of elders or afraid of somebody with dementia, then we started seeing them apply for some of our part-time jobs. And so we actually made some changes in our schedules um, and so housekeeping and dietary are two of those departments where we actually added split shift schedules where we could hire high school students to come in right after school and work in our nursing home. And so it helped us. I've been the administrator here for 13 years and some of our best um, employees have been those young kids who've gone on to become nurses. Um, and some of them even come back here to work with us or at least on their school breaks until, you know, they find out where they're going or what they're doing. Um, we had a housekeeper that worked here after school in housekeeping and 
she just transitioned to the University of Wyoming. And so we had her for a long time after school and in the summer until which time it was time for her to go on to the university. So it's proven very effective for us here. And um, it just brings life and a blending of generations and kind of dispels that ageism and that attitude of separation of elders. Um, we don't, we all live together in this space. We are guests in their home. And that's what we teach these kids. That's what we teach our care partners. Um, and we have fun here. Um, and I think that intergenerational program was a catalyst for us in just incorporating those things and addressing ageism and how we can make this a home-like environment and sustain that. Part of ageism, um, part of ageism is um, not looking at age at all, um, but looking at a person, um, looking at looking at us as individuals, and bringing kids into the home and being spontaneous and having fun really brings out life and fun with our elders. Um, we have an, an elderly gentleman who loves to have a squirt gun in his hand. And one of the spontaneous activities that's done around here is every once in a while, activities will on the sly give him a squirt gun I could be walking down the hallway and be so stressed out or have so many things on my mind or, you know, whatever that might look like, whether we're COVID testing or running three admits, whatever we're doing, you walk around the corner and get hit by a squirt gun and somebody that's just giggling and laughing and having a good time, that's living. That's living. And it's okay to live. And I think we have well established that through the programs that we've developed here and um, to promote healthy, fun, clean living. I have an Australian Shepherd and he's been coming up here since he was eight weeks old. Um, and he's just gotten to know the nursing home, the residents. He knows what employees to go to when he needs to go out back. He knows what residents, family members bring him in treats for him. He knows what residents to stay away from. Um, he loves to play balloon volleyball with them and he'll go and, and hit the volleyball and, and play with them. Um, he's crawled up in bed with a couple of residents. We have another nurse, um, Angie, who has Murphy and he's kind of been our mascot here as well. He's a golden doodle. He's a big, lazy golden doodle and he loves to be petted and he loves to hold hands. And so where Cowboy brings energy, Murphy brings love and peace. And so, you know, they, um, the residents embrace that. They love that. It makes them happy. They ask for, for the dogs. Um, and again, it's part of just living and not being institutionalized and not being told that you can't do something. My son has, um, a corn snake, an Alabama corn snake, and activities approached me one day and said, hey, what if you brought Sally in to see the residents? And I'm like, I don't know how they would react to Sally. But I said, well, we can try it. And believe it or not, we had more female residents that wanted to play with and hold that snake than we had male residents. They were so excited and what that did for them is we ended up having a reminiscent therapy and we had ladies playing with these snakes and telling us how, you know, they used to go catch snakes out in the fields and play with them and throw them at one another. And, you know, we did this and we did that. And they're just passing this snake around like nobody's business. And I thought, wow, who would have thought? Um, and so we brought her in a couple of different times. Another time, you know, we're in Wyoming and, and we've got ranchers around here and somebody contacted us and said, hey, we have the cutest baby goats that were just born. What if we bring a baby goat up to the nursing home? I said, sure, bring it. So we put a diaper on him, 
brought this baby goat in and they were new, new, newer baby goat. And the residents passed that baby goat around like a baby and played with him and cuddled him. And, and again, it brought out reminiscent therapy and started talking about, oh, I remember when, you know, I was a kid and we did this or my grandmother had goats or what have you. And it just brings out a lot of happy memories and funny stories and fond thoughts and um it's spontaneous and and again that's just part of living um we my husband and i bring our horses up and um we tie them right up outside the nursing home right along the railway and um, and we have many pictures of elders going out and petting our horses and feeding them oats and just loving on them and and um, that was a just a a yearly request, sometimes twice a year. When are you bringing the horses up? Bring the horses up. I want to see the horses. And you know, again, being in Wyoming and a lot of them growing up here and around here on ranches and what have you, that was amazing for them to have that experience. They, you know, they never thought they'd see another horse again, let alone pet one or get a feed at some oats. And so we really try and think outside the box and just bring that life back back into them. Um, fishing, fishing is big around here. We have the Flaming Gorge and if they grew up around here, they fish the gorge. That's just um, the way it is. And then we have the Green River. So we've got fly fishermen, we've got lake fishermen. And so we take trips out to the Flaming Gorge and we take them out on pontoon boats and we get ramps so we can take wheelchairs out onto the pontoon boats, I think. Um, the most residents we've taken out at one time was 18, 19, 19 residents out on three pontoon boats. Um, and what great fun that is. And for those who can't necessarily go out on the boat, we take another trip out to the Lake Lodge and we um, partner with the Lake Lodge and they serve those residents lunch. And so we really try to live. Um, and we would look forward to those times where we're able to do that. We also have monthly um, cocktail hours. So we kind of follow the national calendar. If it's National Margarita Day, we'll make margaritas. And those who um, it's are safe to have a, a sip of a margarita or what have you, we'll have margaritas. Um, Sometimes we've had mimosas, we've had, um, oh, I don't know. Um, we have a couple of local breweries here and we've just did some brewery tasting. And for some of those residents, that is, that's just a good time. On St. Patrick's Day, we might give them some green beer. Um, and those are things that they, they look forward to, that they enjoy, that they remember, that they covet. Um, and that's life, that's living. Having that culture and that fun and that relationship, getting to know our elders, establishing Eden Buddies with our new care partners and for um, our new care partners to become well known to us and us getting to know them, but then them getting to know our elders and, and what they like to do and who likes to sit by the heater in the morning and who likes to have coffee you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon by themselves or who likes the green tea and so on and so forth and encouraging them to be involved in a part of that and finding their niche amongst those elders. Um, you know, in my 13 years here, I can think of three funerals off the top of my head and there's been more, but there are three in particular that um, will forever stick in my mind. Um, we have hosted full-blown funerals here with our care partners for elders that didn't have other family. And we celebrate their life here in our home. And one was actually a sheriff um, in our community back in the day. And we opened up an open house in our nursing home and hosted his funeral. And I, um, that's just part of the life style that we um that we live here and that we embrace our elders and that we are their family and we are guests in their home and it doesn't stop 
at the end of the day for caring with them and it doesn't stop after they pass. And and I'm really proud of that. And, and our care partners actually actively participated in and made these funerals and these memorials happen. Activities now, as opposed to what they used to be, are more spontaneous. We try not to do the same thing over and over and over again, because they're going to get bored with that. Um, I know I don't want to play bingo every day. I don't, I don't care to play Uno every day. I want to do something new. And by doing something new, it creates a sense of excitement and um, anticipation for these residents. I'm Heidi Shu. I am the social services director here for Mission at Castle Rock. Um, I have been here for the last 10 years. Absolutely love my job and wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, one of the things I feel that sets us apart from other homes is our resident council. Our resident council isn't your typical resident council. Um, we do still meet once a month, just like normal, but we involve our residents in all the decisions. Um, we vote on a lot of things. We have a slush fund, which is our um, resident and employee fund. Um, any kind of donations for activities goes into that fund. Um, and before we do something, whether it be the county fair, or a lot of times we have Western Wyoming Community College in Rock Springs, about 12 miles away, that puts on a, amazing plays that our residents love to go to. Um, things like that, the slush fund will pay for, but we always take it to the residents to see how they want to spend that money. I feel like that's so important. Um, this is their home. In essence, that's their money. Um, we always talk about all the goings on in the building, whether it be new construction that's gonna be taking place, what they would like to see in that new construction. Um, we're gonna be tearing out our nurses station here soon and putting in a little living area and making our home more home-like. One of the things that was suggested by a resident was to put carpet in that area. It's a very large area with a high ceiling and it echoes and they feel like the carpet will really make it more warm for one and bring that echo down and make it much more home-like. So that is something we're doing. Um, we involve them in all of our um, staffing. Um, if we're running shorthanded, we're going to let them know. We're going to let them know what we're hiring for, um, what we're looking for, what we need. Um, they can bring up any questions and concerns in this meeting. Department heads are always um, in the meeting so they can address any concerns real time. Um, I think it's it kind of sets us apart from other places. Shout out Brooklyn. Brooklyn goes above and beyond to do care, and I appreciate her patience, too. Nice.
I play here is the Eden Core team leader. Um, I've been the Eden Core team leader for the last, I wanna say three or four years now. Um, and in part of that, my job is to um, teach our seedling training, which is the very first training that Eden offers to our um, new care partners. Um, we usually do this along with orientation and it happens once a month. And that training lasts two to three hours, depending. Um, sometimes it's longer when you have people who are really engaged, which is always a, a plus. Um, in that, we, we also like to have our residents join in that because the more residents we have that are Eden trained and, and Eden educated, the, the more they feel involved for one. And number two, this is their home. Again, they should have an understanding of how and why we do the things we do, um, how and why. Um, so a lot of times we think of Eden as the garden, truly. And this is kind of how I start out with all of my trainings. Eden is the garden and in seedling, our residents and our care partners are the little seed that we are planting. We're going to water them, we're going to nurture them, and we're gonna help them grow. That is the whole basis behind Eden and our Eden seedling training. We try to get that done within the first month of employment so that everyone is on the same page. So a famous tool in our movement is called the Artifacts of Culture Change. And it was actually funded by CMS, Division of Nursing Homes. I was very fortunate to be the subcontractor to design this tool that did come out in 2006 and it helped homes to show the changes they were making. In fact, think of the word artifacts. If you think of a culture that has gone on before us, an artifact is something we find to prove that it existed. So these are tangible, concrete things that you can go look at and practically touch. If there's a dog that lives in the building, <laughs> you can go see it and pet it. And purposely, we didn't make it an interview tool they also exist, but they're more time consuming. We wanted to get to the practices. And so this tool represents the practices of a change culture. So be aware, watch, look around at the artifacts of an institutional culture, and then realize that there's lots of artifacts of change culture that are now markers of home. They are practices that reflect home. And then we got a grant and came up with an Artifacts of Culture Change 2.0. In fact, the Piner Network received the grant, a CMP grant from the state of Maryland, thank you, Maryland, and we redesigned it, and it now has a much more simple uh, tally point system. Um, a home would indicate whether or not they have a practice fully implemented or partially implemented or not implemented, and I like to add, yet. This really is a self-assessment tool we, we refer to it as an inspirational and educational tool as well, just because if you read it, you'll get excited and you will learn. Uh, and then you could decide to implement some of these practices and then it can be a benchmarking tool where you perhaps uh, complete it annually and see progress. The development of the Artifacts 2.0 version was done very carefully and deliberately uh, by PhD Dr. Amy Elliott, who's worked with us with this tool the whole time and was careful to validate it and also get it published, uh, which it now is, and it's part of the international journal called Activities, Adaptations, and Aging, Dignified and Purposeful Living for Older Adults. In fact, we are making this journal a culture change focused journal and we do have an open call for papers for culture change and transformation. And we'd love to invite anyone to consider doing some research and getting it published in our journal. The artifacts tool breaks down into five sections. I just want to show them to you because I don't have the time to uh, share the whole tool. The sections are resident directed life. There's life again being well-known, 
uh, getting to home and accommodation of needs and preferences, family and community, leadership and team member engagement. In fact, many culture change practices do dovetail with CMS regulation. We end up referencing CMS regs 52 times and that ends up being 27 regs that are supportive of these culture change practices. We're gonna zoom into just one today that's very appropriate for talking about the Eden Alternative. Each resident's comprehensive assessment process addresses the Eden Alternative domains of well-being. I'm gonna tell you what they are here in a minute. Notice we also reference CMS tag 679 activities. Why? Did you know that the Eden Alternative domains of well-being landed in the intent of this regulation? So second sentence, intent. What is the intent of this regulation? To create opportunities for each resident to have a meaningful life by supporting their domains of well-being. CMS even added more to its guidance with one of its next iterations of the regulations because they had not given credit to the Eden Alternative. And so they do that now as well in the guidance and reference the website. So the seven domains of well-being as identified by the Eden Alternative are identity, security, meaning, connectedness, autonomy, growth and joy. But can you imagine living in a nursing home and people actually ask you questions about all these seven domains, in particular joy, how would you feel if you were asked what brings you joy? And that's what's happening in the homes that decide to use these domains of well-being, that decide to become Eden homes. And I wanna highlight growth here as well because within the Eden alternative, Eden has taught us to consider not having care plans, but instead growth plans. Wow, did you know that we're supposed to be growing and developing at every age? So you'll run into that in Eden Homes, just like Morningstar, they have growth plans. And believe it or not, Eden also recommends that we shift over to growth plans for the same reason for people who work there. So instead of employee evaluations, they too have growth plans. And if you want to dive into this area of helping people to continue to grow and develop at all ages, Eden and many of us in the movement recommend using the Live Oak definition of an elder. The Live Oak project began in the 70s. Debbie and Barry Barkin created true community, developed community on purpose with the people who live there. And they, the people who live there, the elders themselves, created this definition. An elder is a person who is still growing, still a learner, still with potential, and whose life continues to have within it promise for and connection to the future. An elder is still in pursuit of happiness, joy, and pleasure, and her or his birthright to these remains intact. Moreover, an elder is a person who deserves respect and honor and whose work it is to synthesize wisdom from long life experience and formulate this into a legacy for future generations. Isn't that beautiful? You can purchase the poster from the Eden Alternative. We highly recommend doing so. And the Barkins and the people who lived at the Live Oak um, nursing home actually read this every day during their community meeting. Can you imagine being reminded how important you are as an elder every day. And now we're gonna run through the seven domains of well-being. I'm gonna show you the definition of each by the Eden Alternative and how Mission at Castle Rock has met them, provided them, is helping the people who live there to have them. You could do this too. So more about growth here, um, Eden defines it as development, enrichment, unfolding, and expanding. Notice that 
apparently we're supposed to be growing at all ages, but we don't really talk about growing at these older ages. So mission at Castle Rock here is helping people to live and grow and give, you know, live life with. Uh, how about like the resident council president doing the shout outs? That's, you know, speaking life into others um, and recognizing we want that from all ages. Identity, being well known, having personhood, individuality, wholeness, having a history, people knowing your history. And notice how well this team does this with the Simply Me forms as well as turning it into a Simply Me journal, which then also translates into very individualized care plans. Nice job, mission. Security, freedom from doubt, anxiety or fear, safe, certain, assured, having privacy, dignity, and respect. You know, Angie, the assistant director of nursing, had told me at one point, we just forced our schedule on them. When, when you get into a pattern of changing culture, you, you get more honest or something, I, I've, not, I've noticed. And looking back, see, she is able to admit <laughs> out loud, we just forced our schedule on them. That is part of changing culture is being honest. And so now look at the flip side and look how it leads to security. To be able to sleep when your body has had enough sleep, <laughs> I consider that security. How about you? You know, making your own choices is, is a part of security. And then, you know, your medications match you. That's a feeling of security, wow. As well as eat when you wanna eat wow don't panic that you won't get enough food later sometimes people take more snacks because there might not be any later you don't hear that going on here so notice how when you change your systems to match the people who live there it really lends to feelings of security autonomy is liberty self-governance self-determination immunity from the arbitrary exercise of authority choice freedom i just love that middle part immunity from the arbitrary exercise of authority do you realize everyone that's another way to describe an institution there's a lot of arbitrary exercise of authority by the institution it ends up being by the staff team members who work there but they don't mean for it to be that way that's why we're trying to chip away at that institutional culture and again your body decides when to wake up. You know what we call that? True choice. <laughs> not, not even walking around asking people when they wanna get up. It's beyond that. Realizing that when it comes to sleep, true choice is every night is different and my body's just gonna wake up when it's had enough sleep. And this team recognizes that. Resident council, notice they make all the decisions. <laughs> Why? Because they live there. Yes, that's how it should be. It's making decisions about their home as well as making decisions daily on a day-to-day -day basis and offering the Eden education to the people who live there, that's autonomy. Meaning, significance, heart, hope, import or importance, value, purpose, reflection, sacred. Oh, I would say we're seeing a lot of meaning taking place in this home one of their goals is for people to feel loved. I love it when love comes up. We are in the work of love, everyone. And this team, this home, this community recognizes that. Bobby even says that they recognize it is sacred work that we do in their home. So we'll move on to connectedness, the state of being connected, alive, belonging, engaged, involved, not detached, connected to the past, the present, the future, connected to personal possessions, connected to place, connected to nature. They're doing all this, but certainly they're connected outside with, with going outside for, um, <laughs> you know, living life outside with the gardening and the horses come to visit, watching the deer, um, connectedness to their community, the annual county fair and fishing trip, uh, wow connectedness to animals, even in the way of the snakes. Ooh, 
I commend those ladies. They're, they're brave women. How about the Eden Buddies? That is deliberately creating connectedness and friendship. You see a lot of family, the community, in and out. Oh my goodness, they had a craft fair. So you've got all these tables of, of people selling their crafts and it brings the community in. Uh, you hear Bobby say, we encourage relationships. They have a lot of connectedness going on. And then we have joy. Joy is happiness, pleasure, delight. I love the word delight, contentment, enjoyment. Oh my goodness, let's just list them. How about happy hour? There's a story, there's a person there who loves to soak up the sun. She goes outside in the back <laughs> and, and sits down and lays down in the sun. I love that. Nerf gun wars, water gun fights, s'mores, goats, prom, talent shows, karaoke. Again, being able to look forward to the annual fishing trip, the getting on the boat, getting on the water, going to the county fair, touching all those animals again. Great job, uh, mission at Castle Rock of creating joy everywhere you turn. Many nursing home teams wonder how to make it work to have animals. Honestly, I hear it over and over. People kind of look at you like, what are you talking about? It's no big deal. We all pitch in. We help the dog go out if they need to go out, come back in. <laughs> they always make it sound like it's not that hard. And I so appreciate that. And the very best resource ever, ever, ever created to, to have animals in a nursing home is sure enough done by the Eden Alternative. It's called the Animal Welfare Guidelines. You can, you can get it from Eden. It's written by two veterinarians who have worked with nursing homes. There, there are chapters on every animal you can imagine. Highly recommend it. I also recommend Eden membership. So even though you've heard the terminology Eden registered, um, that has changed to membership. And you can be a member individually or as one home or as a corporation. And I highly, highly recommend it. Why? Perhaps you can see why in this video, but also because it is a form of accountability. If you don't sign up with someone who will hold you accountable, perhaps um, other things take precedence. This will keep you changing culture. Doing? Huh? What are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm licking. I'm licking. <laughs> <laughs>